A Christmas Carol, presented by the staff of WPLP Radio, our Christmas present to you. Cratchit? But, sir, it's very cold. Put that wood back. Very good, sir. Directly after Christmas, I'll put a lock on the wood box. Understand? Yes, Mr. Scrooge. It's it's only it's a very bitter day, and I have a bit of a cold, sir. That's no excuse for you to rub my wood box. Besides, we all work better in air that's a bit brisk. Yes, sir. that noise. Do you hear? Stop it at once. Merry Christmas, sir. Be off with the lot of you. No need to wish him a Merry Christmas. That's old Scrooge, idiot. Yes, that is old Scrooge, Ebenezer Scrooge. It is the afternoon before Christmas Day in the year of our Lord, 1844. Despite the bitterly cold weather, all of London is in a festive mood. But there is no happy expression on Ebenezer Scrooge's lined face as he closes the front door of his warehouse and returns to his office. He throws a glowering look at his clerk, Bob Cratchit. Satisfied that the poor wretch is hard at work, Scrooge adjusts his spectacles. Then, without warning... A Merry Christmas, Uncle. God save you. Pa! Humbug. Christmas a humbug? Surely you don't mean that, Uncle. Merry Christmas indeed. What right have you to be merry? You're poor enough. What right have you to be dismal? You're rich enough. What's Christmas time to you? But a time for paying bills without money. A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer. If I had my way, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips would be boiled in his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. Now, you keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it. Then let me leave it alone, then. I've always thought of Christmas as a good time. A fine, charitable, pleasant time when men and women open their shut-up hearts freely. And therefore, though Christmas has never put a scrap of silver in my pocket, I believe it has done me good. So I say, God bless it. Well spoken, Mr. Fred. Cratchit, let me hear another sound from you, and you'll keep Christmas by... By losing your situation. Yes, sir. And, and, and to you, sir, you're quite a powerful speaker. I, I wonder why you don't go into Parliament. Don't be angry. I came here to ask you to come to dine with Peg and me tomorrow. I'm not interested. But I want nothing from you. Only your company. No. But why? You've never met my wife. Why did you get married? Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love. Oh, good afternoon. Why can't we be friends? Good afternoon. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to allow you to chase away the Christmas spirit I feel in my heart. A Merry Christmas, Uncle. Huh. And a Happy New Year. A Merry Christmas to you, Bob Cratchit. The same to you, Mr. Fred. Baha. <laughs> Humbug. Ah, good afternoon, sir. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley, my former partner, has been dead these seven years. He died seven years ago this very night. Then I have no doubt his liberality is well represented by his surviving partner. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, we try to make some slight provision for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common comfort, sir. Are there no prisons? Plenty of prisons. And the workhouses? Are they still in operation? They are. Unfortunately, I wish I could say they were not. And the poor law, is it still in full vigor? It is, sir. I was afraid, from what you'd said, that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course. I'm glad to hear it. We chose this time to help these unfortunates. Because it is a time when want is strongest. What shall I put you down for? Nothing. You wish to remain anonymous? I wish to be left alone. I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. 
I help support the establishments that I've mentioned, and those who are badly off must go there. Most of them would rather die than do that. Then let them do exactly that and help decrease the surplus population. Obviously, sir, you are not interested in the misfortunes of others. It's enough for a man to understand his own business and not to interfere in other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good day, sir. Merry Christmas, Mr. Scrooge. Charity, pa, humbug. Mr. Scrooge, sir. Well, what is it, Cratchit?、Uh, I was wondering.、Uh... You, you were wondering if you could go home. Yes, sir. It's getting late. It's but twelve minutes past five o'clock, Cratchit. Your workday ends at six. Yes, I know, sir. But I have to go to the green grocers and the poulterers before I get home, and they close at six sharp. Oh, very well. You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose. If quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, and it's not fair. If if I were to stop a half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used, and and yet you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. It's only once a year, sir. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every twenty-fifth of December.、Uh, but I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier the next morning. Indeed, I will, Mister Scrooge, and Merry Christmas, sir. Ah, humbug. A few minutes later, Scrooge leaves his warehouse and he makes his way to his melancholy chambers, a gloomy suite of rooms. By the light of a single flickering candle, he eats his cold supper.、And、then, to save lighting his stove, Ebenezer Scrooge retires for the night. The minutes tick away. Scrooge sleeps uneasily, tossing from side to side. Suddenly, he awakes with a start. Walking toward him and dragging a heavy chain is a gray, dim figure of a man. It stops at the foot of the bed. Ebenezer, Ebenezer Scrooge, who are you? What do you want of me? Much. Who are you? Ask me not who I am. Ask me who I was. Who were you then? In life. Your partner, Jacob Marley. Can you, can you sit down? You don't believe in me. I don't. Why? Do you doubt your senses? You're nothing but a stomachache, an undigested bit of beef, a broth of mustard, a, a crumb of cheese. There's more <laughs> gravy than grave about you. Hamburg. <laughs> you are wrong. I am the ghost of Jacob Marley. Then why do you come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit does not go forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. You、oh. are fettered. Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link, yard by yard. Of my own free will, I wore it. Is its pattern strange to you? You also wear one, Ebenezer. Only you are still forging yours. Can't you give some words of comfort to me, Jacob? I have none to give. I cannot rest. I cannot linger anywhere. Many weary journeys lie ahead of me. Seven years dead, and travelling all the while. The whole time, no rest, no peace. Incessant torture of remorse. I travel on the wings of the wind. Oh, such was I, an unheeding man. Ah, but you were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business, mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the ocean of my business. At this time of year, I suffer most. You do speak strangely, Jacob. Hear me! My time is nearly gone. I will, but don't be hard upon me. I am here to warn you that you have a chance of escaping my fate. Ah, you are always a good friend to me, Jacob. You will be haunted by three spirits. I I think I'd rather not. You will be haunted by three spirits. 
Without their visits, you cannot hope to escape my fate. Expect the first when the bell tolls one. Couldn't I take them all at once and have it over with? Expect the second when the bell tolls twice, the third when it strikes three times, and heed them when they appear. You will not see me any more, but remember what has passed between us. Try to escape my miserable fate. A Scrooge stirs in frightened silence. The wraith-like figure of his deceased partner dissolves into space. Then, exhausted by the ordeal, Scrooge drops off to sleep. Twelve o'clock comes. Time passes. The curtains of Scrooge's bed are drawn aside, but by no visible hand. There by the bed stands an unearthly visitor, a strange figure, like a child. Its hair is white, and in its hand it holds a sprig of fresh green holly. Scrooge stares and then speaks. Are you the spirit whose coming was told to me by Jacob Marley? I am. Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No. Your past. Rise and walk with me. Where? Out through the window. We are but three stories above ground. I am only a mortal. Bear but a touch of my hand upon your heart, and you shall be upheld in more than this. What are we to do? I am going to help reclaim you. Come, walk with me out into the night, into the past. Tell me, ghost of Christmas past, where are we? Look down, Ebenezer, and remember back. Why, of course. The river, the meadows, and, and and there's my old school. I went there as a lad, but there's no one about. It is Christmas holiday. Let us look into this study hall. Empty except for a young boy sitting at a desk, his head in his hands, left behind. He, he's crying. Poor chap. No place to go at Christmas. Ah, now he's looking up. Do you recognize him? Why, it's... What is his name? Ebenezer Scrooge. I wish, but... But it's too late now. What is the matter? Nothing, nothing. There were some boys singing outside my warehouse door yesterday Christmas carols. I drove them away. Let us see another Christmas. It is a year later, another Christmas. And again, there is the school. That boy, standing in the driveway, pacing up and down. It is I. And what do you see? A coach, coming up the driveway. Now it's stopped, and a little girl gets out. Look, she's hugging me. It's Fan, my sister. Listen to what she says. I've come to bring you home, dear brother. Father's not mean anymore. And he says you're never coming back here. And from now on, we'll always be together. Just think, together, for the first time in four years. Your sister was a delicate creature, kind, big-hearted. So she was. So she was. She died comparatively young. She left one child behind her. Yes, my nephew Fred. He visited you yesterday. So he did. May we leave here? Yes, yes. For there is another shadow. Why, bless my soul. Do you know him? Know him? Of course. Bless his heart. It, it's old Fizzywig alive again. Why, I was one of his first apprentices. He, he taught me my business. A fine man, old Fizzywig. One of you boys, come here. Yes, Mr. Fezziwig. 
Do you know the day, Ebenezer Scrooge? Yes, indeed, sir. It's the afternoon before Christmas. To be sure, to be sure. And no more work for the day. Not a tap of it, understand? Now up with the shutters, Ebenezer. Yes, sir. Tonight we'll dance and sing and play. There'll be no talk of business or profits or losses. Mrs. Fessywig and my daughters will have the finest of foods ready. Oh, I've been smelling those odors all day, sir. Off we go, then. We'll keep Christmas as it should be kept. A silly man. Mr. Fezziwig was not a silly man. He was he was kind and generous. If, if, if only I could speak to him. My time goes short. There is still another shadow. I've seen enough. Are you sure, Ebenezer? I think not. The years have passed. In this house below, look, there sits a young girl. A beautiful girl. It's... It's Belle. The girl you were to marry. And there you sit next to her, a young man in your prime. Only now your face begins to show the signs of avarice. There is a greedy, restless motion in your eyes. Listen to what she is saying to you. It matters very little to you. Another idol has displaced me, a golden one. You hold money more important than me or anything else for that matter. I'm going to grant you your wish, free you of marrying me. That is the way you wish it, Ebenezer. I feel sorry for you. Spirit, show me no more. Today, Belle is a happy woman, surrounded with her fine children. Those children might have been yours if you hadn't been so selfish. Take me back. Haunt me no more. I beg of you, don't. Scrooge finds himself back in his bedroom. Slowly, his door, though bolted, swings open. Ebenezer Scrooge! Ebenezer Scrooge! I am the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me. You're practically a giant, yet you have such a young face. I've never seen the like of you before. I have many brothers, more than 1,800, one for each Christmas. You are here to take me with you? Yes, and I trust you'll profit by your journey. Touch my robe, Ebenezer. Most people in this church, they seem very happy. They are, for they are giving thanks for all the joys brought to them during the year. And the, the crew of that ship over there, look, they're shaking hands with the captain. Wishing him a Merry Christmas, but come. We have not much time left, and there is still another place we must visit. It is a very poor house in a very poor section of London. This one directly below us. Indeed it is. Who, may I ask, lives here? An underpaid clerk named Bob Cratchit. The Bob Cratchit who's employed by me? The very same. That woman, those four children? His wife and family. Coming up the stairs now, that's Cratchit. He's carrying a young boy. His fifth child, Tiny Tim. He carries a crutch. Because he is crippled. But the doctors? Cratchit cannot afford a doctor. Not on 15 shillings a week. But? Shh. Listen. Good afternoon, everyone. And a most Merry Christmas. Father, Tiny Tim. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Welcome. Father, let me take your muffler. And how did Tiny Tim behave at church? Oh, as good as gold and better. I was glad to be able to go to church. That's because I wanted the people to see that I'm a cripple. Now, that's a peculiar thing to say, Tiny Tim. Well, no, it isn't. That's because I was in God's house, and it was God who made the blind able to see and the lame able to walk. 
And when the people at church saw me and my crutch, I was hoping they would think of what God can do, and they would say a prayer for me. I, I'm certain they must have prayed for you. And one of these days, I'm going to get well, and that'll mean I can throw away this crutch and run and play like all the other boys. You will, Tiny Tim, one of these days. And now, Mother, the big question: When will dinner be ready? I'm starving. It's ready now. Just about the finest goose you've ever seen.、Mm. Martha, you carry it in. Tom, you fetch the potatoes and turnips. Dick, Peter, set the chairs around the table, and I'll sit between Father and Mother. This is going to be the best Christmas dinner anyone could hope for, and I'm the luckiest man in the world for having such a fine family. It isn't a very big goose, is it? I could eat the whole bird myself, I believe. It is all Bob Cratchit can afford. His family doesn't complain. To them, that meager goose is sumptuous and more important, much more important, Ebenezer. Yes, go on. They are happy and a united group. Look at their shining faces. Listen to them. Oh, that was good. What a superb dinner we had! The tempting meat, the delicious dressing, and the plum pudding, Father. Don't forget that. That pudding was the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since her marriage. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the compliment. I must confess, it was good. And now for the crowning touch, the punch. Oh, oh good punch! Here we are. Get your glasses. You, Peter, Dick, Tom, Martha, Tiny Tim, and last but far from least, you, Mother, and not to forget myself. There. A toast. First to the founder of this feast, the man who has made it all possible. I give you Mr. Scrooge. Mr. Scrooge, indeed. I wish I had him here. I give him a piece of my mind to feast upon, and hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, the children, Christmas Day. He's a hard, stingy, unfeeling man. You know he is, Robert, better than anyone else. My dear, remember Christmas Day. I'm sorry. Very well. I'll drink his health. Long life to him. A merry Christmas to him. To Mr. Scrooge. To, to Mr. Mr. Scrooge. And now a toast to us. A merry Christmas to us all. God bless us. God bless, God bless us. God bless us, every one. Spirit, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat in the chimney corner and a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. If those shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. Oh no! Oh no, kind spirit. Say he will live. That he will be spared. Why concern yourself about him? Isn't it better that he die and decrease the surplus population? But these poor people must be helped. Are there no prisons and the workhouses? Are they still in operation? Do not taunt me. Come, we must go. Answer me. We have still another stop. Cold, my dear. Just a bit, but I don't mind. We'll be home in another few minutes. This walk will make us hungry. Not too hungry, I hope. Don't worry, Peg. I'm sure there'll be more than enough to eat. Christmas is such a wonderful day, and not humbug as your precious uncle claims. He believed it too. More's the pity. It's hard to have pity for such a man. I feel sorry for him. However, his offenses carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. Funny, he's not wanting to bother with us. All we ask is for his is for his name. Nothing more. He's the only one who suffers by his ill whims. One thing, he's losing a fine dinner by it. Let's hurry home, dear. She seems a nice enough sort, don't you think? I should like to meet her, I believe. You had your chance, Ebenezer Scrooge. Now I must leave you. The time is drawing near. Please, please, kind spirit, don't leave me. Not right now. I wish to talk, to ask your advice. Are you sure you need advice, Ebenezer? After all, are you not a rich man, a man of intelligence, a man who knows his own mind? No, no. Goodbye, Ebenezer. Wait for the stroke of three. As Ebenezer Scrooge comes to his senses, he discovers himself standing on the street outside of his lodgings. A heavy snow is falling, blanketing a sleeping London. The wind has died down. It is still early Christmas morning. Ebenezer, Ebenezer Scrooge. You, 
You are the third and last. I am the ghost of Christmas yet to come. You are about to show me shadows of things that have not happened, but, but will happen in the time before us. I, is that so, Spirit? Yes, Ebenezer, that is correct. I tremble at going with you. I, I fear what I am to see. Come, Ebenezer. Why do we stop on this street corner, Spirit? Those two men standing there, do you know them? Why, why, yes. I, I do business with them. Their conversation is interesting. When did he die? Last night, I believe. I thought he'd never die. What's he done with his money? I haven't heard. Left it to his company, perhaps. Now, one thing is certain. He didn't leave it to charity. Are you going to the funeral? <laughs> Not unless a free lunch is provided. <laughs> Good point. I can't say that I blame you. Spirit, th this dead man they were discussing, who is he? I will show you. This room, it's too dark to see. In front of you is a bed. On it lies a man, the body of the man those men on the street were discussing. And no one has come to claim this body. No one. For he left not a friend behind him. Come closer and look into his face. No. Spirit, this is a fearful place. Let us go. Look at the face of this unclaimed man. I would do it if I could, but but I haven't the power. Let me see some, some tenderness connected with a death. If, if I don't, that lonely body in this dark room will ever haunt me. Yes, I know of such a home. One where there is tenderness connected with death. Over here. On this poor street and in this dismal house. But this house? Why, why yes, I, I've been there before. Bob Cratchit, my clerk, lives there. There's Mrs. Cratchit and her eldest daughter, Martha. Your eyes, Mother. You'll strain them working in this bad light. I'll stop for a while. I wouldn't show weak eyes to your father when he comes home. It's time he was here. Past it, rather. But these days he walks slower than he used to, Mother. I have known him to walk with Tiny Tim upon his shoulder very fast indeed. He was very light to carry, and your father loved him so. It was no trouble. There's your father now at the door. You're late tonight, Robert. Yes, I'm late. I'll get some tea for you, Father. Thank you, Martha. You went there today, Robert? Yes. I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to see how green a place it is. I'll see it soon. I promised him I'd walk there every Sunday. My poor Tiny Tim... At last he got rid of his crutch. Yes, at last he did. Our poor, Tiny Tim. Tell me, Spirit, why did Tiny Tim have to die? Come. There is still another place to visit it. A graveyard. Why do we pause here? That tombstone. Read the name on it. Before I do, answer me one question. Are these the shadows of the things that will be, or, or are they the shadows of the things that, that may be only? The inscription on the tombstone. It reads, Ebenezer Scrooge. No, spirit. Oh, oh no, hear me. I, I'm not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been but for this lesson. I will honor Christmas in my heart. But will you? Oh, yes, and I will try and keep it alive all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. I, I will not shout out the lesson that the three spirits have taught me. Oh, tell me there is hope that I may sponge away the writing on this stone. What am I holding on to? The bedpost. I, I mean my own bed. Home. Those bells. It, it, it must be Christmas Day. Christmas Day? I, I, I wonder if it really is. We shall see. And open the window. You, boy, down there. Eh? What day is it today, my fine lad? Today? Why, Christmas Day, of course. 
<laughs> and to think the spirits have done it all in one night. What did you say, sir? I do you know the poulters in the next street. I should hope I did. Uh, an intelligent boy, uh, a remarkable boy. D- do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging in the window? The one as big as me? What a delightful boy. Yes, yes, the one as big as you. It's hanging in there now. It is? Well, go and buy it. You're pulling my leg. Uh, Indeed, I'm not. Here is the money. Go buy it and deliver it to Bob Cratchit, who lives on Golden Street in Camden Town. Cratchit? Golden Street? Camden Town? I understand. But, sir, there will be considerable change left over. Almost half a sovereign. Well, <laughs> keep it, my boy. Keep it. Oh, thank you, sir. A- and, boy, don't let Mr. Cratchit know who sent the turkey. I- it's a surprise and-, and something else. A very Merry Christmas to you. We'll be ready for dinner in another half hour. Fine. I'm as hungry as the proverbial bear. If it's someone looking for charity, do what you can. This took a lot of courage, but here I am. Well, nephew, introduce me to your wife. Uncle Ebenezer, this is Peg. That's no way to greet an uncle. (laughs) That's the way to greet an uncle. Uh, Are you a good cook, Peg? Oh, yes, quite good. She's a wonderful cook. I'm sure she is. I've accepted your invitation for Christmas dinner. From now on, both of you had had better plan on seeing a great deal of me. I'll explain it all later, but but right now, let me say that I'm a changed man. Well, Cratchit, what do you mean by coming to work at this time of day? You're eighteen and one half minutes late. I'm sorry, sir. I overslept. Overslept, eh? Uh, a poor excuse. Please, sir, it happens but once a year. I was making rather merry yesterday. Step this way. Now, I'll tell you what, my friend. I'm not going to stand for this sort of thing any longer. Therefore, I'm going to raise your salary. A uh, uh, Merry Christmas, Bob. A uh, uh, Merry Christmas than I've given you for many a year. Are you well, sir? Couldn't be better. And this afternoon, we'll discuss how I can best help you and your family, uh, especially Tiny Tim. He'll get well. I'll see to that. Now, make up the fire and, and buy another coal scuttle before you dot another eye. You seem in unusually fine spirits today, sir. Spirits? Spirits? <laughs> I should be, for for I was visited by by three of the nicest and wisest spirits that, that ever walked the earth. God bless you, sir. And as Tiny Tim would say, God bless us, everyone. Scrooge was better than his word. He did everything he promised and infinitely more. He became a persistent visitor to his nephew's home, even took Fred into business with him, and he raised Bob Cratchit's salary to a figure that left that bewildered gentleman gasping. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He provided doctors for the little lad. Very soon, Tiny Tim will have his wish. He will be able to throw away his crutch and run and play like the other boys. As for the three spirits, well, Ebenezer Scrooge never saw them again. That was due to the unchallengeable fact that Scrooge, for the rest of his days, helped keep alive the spirit of Christmas. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us. Everyone. A Christmas Carol presented by the staff of WPLP Radio, featuring Art Deneen as Scrooge, Tony Venuto as Bob Cratchit, Ken Charles as the solicitor, Dave Sweat as Fred. Don Richards as Jacob Marley, Chris James as the first ghost, Bob Lassiter as the second ghost, Art Deneen as the third ghost, Nancy Donellan as Belle, Lynn Robison as Fan, Mary Turner as Mrs. Cratchit, Marty Costa as Martha, Tracy Fox as Peg, Mark Brewer and Art Deneen as the two men, and Mike Serio as the boy and Tiny Tim. And narrated by yours truly, David Fowler. A Christmas Carol Hour present to you. From all of us here at WPLP, Merry Christmas and a prosperous New Year.